Robert McNamara, a former U.S. Defense Secretary and President of the World Bank, and Nobel scientist Norman Borlaug, now over 90 years old, are credited with playing a pivotal role in the creation of the CG. Well, I don't know where he had put his accomplishment. I put it very, very high in relation to his advance of the human race. And my establishment of the CGIR is one of the things I'm most proud of. The establishment of that institution brought immense progress to some of the poorest people in the world. To discover how the CG came about, its role in the success of world agriculture, and to seek remedies for our present and future food crises, we must first travel back over 130 years. In the 1870s, Japanese farmers, ever short of land in a crowded island, began to search for a wheat variety that would increase their yields. It became known as Norin Ten. Throughout history, farmers have crossbred their food crops. They'd select which plants would be fertilized with which, or graft stems from one plant onto another to encourage the plant's best characteristics. Sometimes it would be for drought toleration, sometimes for yield, and sometimes just for easy cooking and taste. Some of the worst dust storms in the history of the whole world, I guess, broke loose. That was in the 1930s, America had been suffering from a decade of drought, which laid waste to its breadbasket, the Great Plains. Overgrazed and overplowed, they became known as the Dust Bowl. Soil blew from the south in a yellowish-brown haze and in rolling walls of black from the north. Farmers watched helplessly as their crops disappeared. The poverty of small farmers led researchers to begin looking for more scientific ways to raise crop yields. In 1942, with funds from the Rockefeller Foundation, a four-man team began work breeding wheat at a research center in Mexico. It included Norman Borlaug, who took charge of the program in 1945. I grew up on the land, on a small farm in northeast Iowa. Life was not always easy. I experienced the economic depressions of the 1930s. And from this experience, I felt that families on the land needed help from scientists, and I dedicated my life to science, and especially to food production. Their work was painstakingly slow, but by 1955, the researchers had succeeded in taking seeds from the Japanese Norin Ten variety and crossing them with North American semi-dwarf lines. The result was exceptional a high-yield wheat variety that would grow in tropical conditions. By the early 1960s, Pitek 62 and Panjamo 62 were ready for commercial planting. The project formed the foundation for what became known as the Green Revolution, a revolution in farming that turned countries such as India from being food deficient to one of the world's leading agricultural nations. However, India had to suffer a terrible famine before their innovations were given political impetus. Robert McNamara was then president of the World Bank. There was a very severe famine in India in 1967. Thousands were dying. And uh, Subramaniam, who was one of the great heroes of the Green Revolution, was then the agricultural minister. And he asked the U.S. government to provide surplus grains, wheat, in the U.S. that the law had made available on a very subsidized basis to certain of the developing countries. And Johnson said, hell no, the Indians have to learn to feed themselves. And I said, why don't we make a package deal? We'll supply wheat uh, to India, and they, if they will agree to use some of the proceeds to start the application of these new agricultural techniques, which had this potential for tremendous increases in production. Subramaniam just grabbed it. That's exactly what he wanted to do. And that's how it started. India and Pakistan both committed to Borlaug's approach, and the results in places like the Punjab were dramatic. 
wheat production moved decisively upward, with yields in some cases three times higher than traditional varieties. It marked the beginning of the Green Revolution. The story of Dr. Borlaug's breakthrough in Mexico goes much further. In the late 1950s, the heads of the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations happened to take the same commuter train to their offices in Manhattan. So began a series of meetings which led to Borlaug's pioneering work on wheat being extended to rice. Rice is the staple food for nearly half the world's inhabitants and with world population continuing to grow, there was pressure to produce new, ever more productive and disease-resistant varieties. Seeing the work Borlaug and his team had been doing on wheat, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations established the International Rice Research Institute, IRI, in collaboration with the government of the Philippines. It soon resulted in hugely successful new rice varieties. After a quarter of a century of painstaking research, Norman Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1970. I call upon you, Norman Ernest Borlaug, to come to the rostrum and receive the diploma and the gold medal of the Nobel Peace Prize for 1970. There's no Nobel Prize for food or agriculture. And it was only under the various disastrous conditions, the hunger, the famine of the middle 60s yes. in India and yeah. in Pakistan that the Nobel Committee looked at what was happening in starvation, what was happening in the Green Revolution that was changing everything in the Nobel Prize for peace came to agriculture for the first time. I am acutely conscious of the fact that I am but, but one member of that vast army of hunger fighters, and so I want to share not only the present honors, but also the future obligations with all my companions in arms. <laughs> 